Welcome everyone to the third conversation in our town hall series, Equity Starts With Access. My name is Jamie Bruni Miles, President and CEO of the YMCA San Francisco and co-moderator for tonight's discussion. The purpose of the YMCA town hall series is to convene experts in relevant fields to discuss the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Bay Area communities through the lens of youth education, public health and equity. Through these discussions, we seek to create a space for community members to engage in meaningful conversations, learn more about the resources available, and gain a deeper understanding of the issues at hand. In the previous town halls, we discussed the pandemic broader impact and some key initiatives. Tonight, we're taking a deep dive into one of our counties, one of our counties organization we serve, Marin County. We'll be highlighting a specific program, the Marin County Community Learning Hubs. Bringing together panelists who were instrumental in developing, supporting, and providing the tools to ensure this initiative sustainability. When choosing panelists, the Y cast intentionally wide net through various fields and carefully narrows down panelists based on specific criteria, including subject matter expertise and connection to community. The panelists for tonight were chosen thoughtfully out of a large pool of highly qualified individuals. They are preeminent experts and Marin County leaders in education, public health, and government. We're confident they will bring diverse perspectives and collective value to the conversation. They also bring about the ability and jurisdiction to address our collective challenges head on and in real time. The Y is committed to fostering conversations that are representative of our values as a community. And we look forward to having a robust conversation and thoughtful dialogue and are excited about your participation. Now let's meet our panelists. Mary Jane Burke, Marin Superintendent of Schools. Superintendent Burke has spent her entire career in the education field and in 1994 was elected Marin County Superintendent of Schools. Responsible for managing the Marin County Office of, Educa Office of Education, which serves more than 40,000 students and oversees more than 450 million in public education funds countywide. Dr. Lisa Santora, Marin County Deputy Public Health Officer. Dr. Santora has had an extensive career in the medical field and has served as a deputy health officer for Marin County for over four years. Recently, Dr. Santora has been in contact with the Biden administration as they seek to learn from the Marin County pandemic response, which Dr. Santora was instrumental in developing in her role. And finally, California State Assembly Member Mark Levine. Assembly Member Levine is a Democrat who represents the 10th California Assembly District, which encompasses Marin and Southern Sonoma counties, and was recently reelected. Congratulations. The assembly members' legislative priorities include providing support for children and their families, tenant protections, educator related, related initiatives, and increased mental health care. Combine the panelists will allow us to have a robust conversation. As a community, we're facing two pandemics. COVID-19 struck as an invisible enemy, now responsible for more than 280,000 deaths in the US and loss of millions of jobs. Secondly, COVID-19 has heightened our collective awareness of racial inequities that existed for centuries. Both pandemics significantly impact our communities in a complex ways that are often hard to comprehend. Now, more than ever, we are pressed to find innovative solutions that ensure our communities can thrive. When COVID-19 hit, the YMCA quickly adapted our programming to address the needs of communities by providing childcare to essential workers and deepening the reach of our social services that target our most vulnerable populations. Today, we continue to provide safe spaces for young people to engage in school through our academic enrichment hubs, access to our food pantries, mental health services, family support, and adult wellness services in the three counties we serve, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Marin. We are living in time of uncertainty. We must come together as a community to collaborate and find the best path forward. To that end, conversations like tonight allow us to extract meaning and insight to understand better the impact of 2020 in all of our lives. Tonight, we bring Marin County leaders together to discuss our community's response to these pandemics, give you an opportunity to engage, and highlight the Marin Community Learning Hub. I also want to introduce my co-moderator, John Eberly, YMCA San Francisco Association Vice Chair and Board Member, YMCA Marin Community Learning Hub's Task Force Leader, and longtime Marin County resident and YES parent. Our format for tonight is to ask the panelists questions for 45 minutes and provide you, the audience, an opportunity for questions for the last 15. To ask the questions, please enter them in the Q&A section. Thank you, and let's get started. The first question tonight goes to Vice Chair John Eberly. Thank you so much, Jamie, and good evening to the audience. Thank you for joining us and to these 
a fantastic panelists for making the time for this conversation tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. As Jamie mentioned, I'm the vice chair of the YMCA Association Board. Uh, I'm on the Marin Hubs Task Force helping with that initiative. Uh, but most importantly, I'm a Marin resident and parent of a school aged child. So that's the lens tonight that I'll be asking my questions uh, to, to you panelists. So tonight we're going to have a dialogue. I'll start with one question to, to one of the panelists, but I hope that the other panelists will join in and add their perspectives and, and, and uh, background and knowledge to the conversation. I'll start with Dr. Santora. Dr. Santora, we recently had another shift in our community COVID-19 response. Uh, Marin County and the Bay Area, starting earlier this week, are now under a new stay-at-home order. We're all happy to hear that playgrounds have been uh, restored to us under this uh, new order just recently. Uh, but could you talk to us a little bit about the implications of that order on schools, on children, and on all of us here in Marin County? Absolutely. We have led the nation in the Bay Area in implementing public health, decisive public health actions in order to flatten the curve and to protect our communities and protect our health care system. And again, we found ourselves uh, after the holidays seeing surges in cases in our community. Yesterday, we had a record high of 92 cases, um, which is re reaffirms the decision again to lead and to move towards a stay at home order. And what we have seen over the past couple of weeks is that private gatherings of more than three households really have been the primary driver of community transmission of COVID-19. And as opposed to schools, schools are safer places to be than homes. And at our homes, we allow other households to enter where we may or may not know their uh, risk of COVID-19 or past exposure to COVID-19. And that's very different in our school environments. We have developed and structured the return to school to ensure the safety of all. And we can't have a zero risk environment, but we know that at, in the community at large, in your homes, you're 15 times more likely to be exposed to COVID-19 than you are in our schools. And that's why we have a new approach and we, we have demonstrated its success in Marin County and are looking to see it grow outside to support the return of schools, uh, return of kids to schools where they can support their education. And again, we now have learned with COVID-19 that schools should be the last to close and should be the first to open. And that's why it's critical for us all as a community to stay at home, to keep schools safe so kids can continue to learn. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Levine, uh, Superintendent Burke, would you like to add any thoughts on the stay at home order, the community's response to COVID or how that impacts uh, the children and education in our community? Sure, so maybe I could just add that just today, Dr. Santora and Dr. Willis met with us, all the superintendents in our, you know, in our community to sort of talk through the steps and like, what's the, what's the impact? So people are now aware that on uh, January 4th, we're expecting all schools that have been open to be able to return to school following all the protocols that we've developed together with public health. Um, and right now we have set an opportunity to talk together on January 29th, excuse me, December 29th to get a sense of where we are in terms of the tiers. So we're planning ahead to make sure that we don't feel like we don't know when we're going to communicate again. So we'll get more information. So the, the question is really going to be for our high schools um, who are planning to return to school in January um, and whether or not we'll be able to from a public health uh, standpoint and, and given the state information. So um, that's just to let everybody know we're in communication, Dr. Santor, Dr. Willis, and we feel like we're you know, well, we stand ready to uh, get the information out into our community um, as soon as we can. And so that will be December 29th. And John, thank you for helping to spread the news of the playground availability now during this stay at home that is different from the last. What we saw in the early part of the pandemic was a, a rush to our parks and to our coasts because um, people did want to get outside and we want to encourage that for both physical and, and mental health, but this also left children behind in what they could do on a daily basis if they didn't live close to those types of resources. And, uh, and now with the availability of playgrounds, this brings a little bit more equity 
into the state and, and how children are being treated because in some communities, children may not have backyards or nearby uh, places to go that are different from a playground specifically and, uh, and, and the ability to travel to somewhere else, even though we're supposed to stay at home. And, and um, this is going to make this a lot better for a lot of families, uh, particularly those who live in, in multifamily housing that may have a playground to play at nearby, but no yard for the children to run around. Dr. Santoy, you said something that really struck me um, during your initial remarks on this, uh, which is, um, and correct me if I didn't hear this right, that uh, in some cases the schools are safer than the homes. This is a lot different than what we heard, you know, in the spring and the summer, and really changes my perspective on on on, on the various places that our kids might be. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, um, it's something we're probably most proud of working together. Since Saturday, March 14th, when schools closed, we started conceiving being data-driven and science-driven ways that we can support the safe return of kids to schools. So when kids return to schools um, in Marin County, it's unlike some of the early pictures you saw in Georgia of crowded hallways and no face coverings. These are very structured, supervised environments where staff have been trained how to implement our safety measures where we're maximizing physical distance, all students are wearing face coverings and implementing all the guidance that we have available to us on how to create a safe environment. When we go home is when we relax and we um, let our guards down. We introduce people into our homes, um, which was not allowed, but clearly it happened over the holidays. And we don't know their risk. We don't know who they've been exposed to and people can transmit, transmit this disease asymptomatically. And when you're in your homes, um, most times people, again, let their guards down. You're not having your guests wear face masks. You're eating and drinking together and sitting less than six feet apart, especially um, if alcohol is consumed. And I know this is geared towards children, but that's part of the realities and why we are also suspending alcohol and beverage services, because that's when people let their guards down. And so in school, it's a structured, supervised environment where it's safer for kids. And what we're seeing also, it's stabilizing for community transmission. When we open schools, the, the transmission of COVID-19 continued to go down in Marin County faster than in any other county. And we held in the orange and the red tier longer than any other county and stood out. And I think schools played a critical role in that because parents and guardians weren't forced to find alternative childcare arrangements and mixed households for socialization. And that's why organizations like the YMCA are critical because it provides structured supervised environments for children and adults to thrive. And so it's that structure and supervision that makes it safe. It's when we mix and relax and are casual when we become unsafe. I'm gonna thank you so much for your remarks on this. I'm gonna shift gears and direct a question uh, to Superintendent Burke. And uh, this came from some uh, questions that we received by email when we sent out the invitation to this session. And um, I tried to incorporate several questions that are on uh, the mind of the audience uh, into this. Uh, and I think it's close to a lot of our hearts uh, as parents who watched the, the COVID-19 response evolve and, and unfold. And anyone who's a parent here in Marin uh, is aware that there are differences in the school experiences and educational experiences across families and across schools. And some schools are open in hybrid mode. Some schools are fully uh, 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 distanced or, or fully in person. Um, and then of course there are differences in the experiences for uh, more vulnerable families or uh, essential families of essential workers who need to be out of the home. Uh, could you give us some of your perspective on first why these ex these experiences vary from family to family across the county uh, and kind of where we're going from here and what your vision is uh, for uh, unifying the school experience if, if that's the uh, direction we're going? Yeah, sure. So let me start by saying what is absolutely the same between every school in Marin County, pi public, private, independent, parochial, and that is that we have worked together over many months to ensure that there is an actual plan that came out on June 18th. It's called the school site specific plan um, that frames the structure that has to be in place with very specific detail in order for a school to open. And so that's called the school site specific plan. And that is in common in every school across the county. Uh, that plan has to be worked on by a team of people at a school and then ultimately has the review of public health. 
So that's what's in common. Um, what is different is that uh, whether it's a public school, private independent school, that the ultimate decision about the how, like what it looks like when school opens, um, happens at that level. And so what we see in Marin County is um, a varied approach. So in some school districts uh, or independent schools, you might see students are coming five days a week. Uh, they are perhaps on an AM, PM schedule with smaller cohorts, maybe something like 12 to 14 students. Others are, have looked at Monday, Tuesday off Wednesday with another group coming Thursday, Friday. Others, so there's a different sort of hybrid models. However, um, the goal and the direction we're going is that this 30 point plan that was developed in June continues to be updated, does allow for students to return to school um, using actually their typical class size. So everybody started with smaller groups, right? But at this point, we know that um, soon students will be able to return with their typical class size, i.e. a single cohort. And what public health has described is that from a safety standpoint, it will be better to have a larger single cohort than two smaller cohorts in terms of transmission of COVID, et cetera. So that's sort of the direction that we're going. Um, the schools at this point, 80 plus percent of the schools in Marin County have some in-person going on. Um, and um, bottom line is the schools that we don't yet see open are the public um, high schools. Those are anticipating hopefully to get to begin in June, uh, in, Jan in June, that would be awful, in January, first week of January or in that time frame. Um, but all of that happens sort of at the local level. And I think we just have to be reminded that that it that first step in is a hard one, right? People are scared, they're, they're anxious, right? They wonder, is it gonna be safe? And what we have found is once our staff is back into, into school, uh, they see the protocols that are in place, they see that they have everything they need um, in order to feel safe, that that's when um, they feel safe and then parents feel safe, right? We have about 85 to 90% of students from our public school who are attending uh, school um, in person. And the success that we have is, um, is really, uh, you know, obviously very, very positive in that we have over approximately 400 and something days of in-person instruction um, and there has been no trans COVID transmission, student to student, student to staff, staff to student. There have been two situations uh, that had to do with staff, but uh, so we feel very good about it. And uh, we're seeing people feel more comfortable, more positive, um, but we'll pay tribute to that. Um, well, let me say what, something about the more vulnerable kids. That's where we started. So um, last spring, um, after the pop-up child care, which uh, the Y essentially was one of the lead community partners, um, and thank you for that. We will be forever grateful, not to mention what you're doing right now. You have over 11 uh, child care opportunities for students right now throughout the county, serving over 300 students. But um, what we did is we said, hey, the most vulnerable kids, we've got to figure this out. So in the spring, we piloted uh, four different classes, preschool students, students um, 18 to 22, students that uh, would not yet wear a mask. You know, just picture exactly the hardest kids, vulnerable um, in terms of their medical fragility, et cetera. And so we did a pilot, applied um, the uh, protocols that had been developed and once we did that, we saw, hey, we can do this. So it worked, it was positive. And then we were able to stand up all of those special ed and alternative ed programs this last summer. But um, it was one of the, from an educational standpoint, um, it, it took us looking in the mirror and saying, wait a second, speaking of access, these students are not accessing, unable to access their education virtually. And um, that, May, you know, we had to admit that instead of say, oh yeah, no, no, it's fine, we're doing fine. And I, I would contend that there are a few students uh, where a virtual approach um, is providing for them what we know they need related to connectivity, you know, and all, all of the things that uh, provide a whole educational experience uh, for a student. But we owe great tribute to uh, public health and our districts are amazing. You know, 
to find that um, you look at all, right around Marin County and throughout the state in their school districts that are not reopening um, and they've decided actually to stay virtual for the whole year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the, 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 the answer and the vision of where we're going. It sounds like uh, um, we are learning what is working and reacting to bring those uh, those protocols and those learnings into into action. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to shift. Uh, we're going to come back uh, in a few minutes to the learning hubs that uh, we have here in Marin County and some of the ways we're uh, helping the the most vulnerable and kids with the highest opportunity. But I'd like to just uh, direct a question to Assemblymember Levine. Uh, uh, considering that we are now almost a year into the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and and uh, as Jamie said, congratulations on your reelection. I think this is your third day in session. So uh, <laughs> thanks for making the time for us. Could, could you talk a little bit uh, about wh what uh, opportunities the pandemic uh, has presented in terms of reevaluating our policy priorities uh, with all the changes that are happening around us? And it, Talk about the continuity between your previous policies and, and legislative agenda and, and today's in this moment. And the pandemic is an opportunity for us to look at uh, old problems uh, with, with renewing that effort. And so, for example, one bill that I had introduced last year before the stay at home order, before we really knew that the pandemic was going to impact us this way, was um, removing the average daily attendance method of funding our schools. That way, if a student wasn't in school, if they had a personal thing they had to do or religious observance, so they had to be out of town, uh, a school would not receive money if it was funded through ADA. And I thought that was an archaic way of funding schools and actually punishing other students because their, their classmates weren't in class that day uh, for the uh, following year. So I introduced that legislation. And as we adjourned and recessed, uh, for the first stay at home period in March, we passed a budget bill that did hold our schools harmless for attendance uh, last year and, and now going into this year. And so this is uh, something that we're doing through the pandemic, but I think it's something that we've learned um, funds our schools better. And, uh, and in fact, uh, we've been funding our schools a little bit extra and, uh, you know, in, including to make sure that we can mitigate educational loss that's occurring um, that we know is happening throughout the state because students aren't in, in the class. But there's um, so much more that we have to do um, that, uh, that you know, informs us through this time. So for example, students weren't in school. Um, we've got 3.8 million students that were on free or reduced lunch programs. So we needed to make sure and help and support schools that could pivot to making sure that the schools could still provide a meal to a student, even if they weren't learning um, at school. And some of the, the Marin schools did miraculous work. Uh, and I really just give credit to all of the people that, uh, that showed up to make sure that food was, was provided for students. We also pushed $365 per student, uh, per family, uh, per student and per family in CalFresh benefits so that in the pandemic, we know how important food was to people uh, and, and making sure that, that they had healthy food at home, that we were able to make sure that they had that resource, particularly if they weren't getting it from, you know, whether they were not able to get to the uh, school uh, site or get the meals that they needed. We know how much the burden was on our food pantries and thank you so much to the Y for expanding and opening yours um, through the pandemic. So we have to renew our uh, efforts in this area. These aren't new problems. We've been working on food security issues for a while as well, but the um, the need for it is is as strong as it's ever been. Another area that I'd worked on for a long time was um, protecting people's data, data privacy. And last year, and, and now this year, I'm introducing legislation on making sure that in contact tracing, particularly with the app that the state is releasing tomorrow, um, private uh, sector apps as well that do contact tracing that that uh, data that is collected is um, held privately, is not used in ways that we wouldn't want used. We know that in um, throughout the pandemic, immigrant communities have been really hard hit. And we wanna make sure that uh, in, if contact tracing is used, that immigration status, for example, 
would not be used against someone through that contact tracing um, uh, uh, you know, practice. So um, similar issue area, but a different purpose uh, and a renewed purpose in many of those issue areas. Hey Lisa, would you mind talking just a little bit about the shift in where we're seeing the positive testing, you know, from the Latinx community? This is really interesting, Mark, uh, in terms of the shift that's happened in Marin County. I think it's it's important. Yes. So at the beginning of this pandemic, we saw the the pandemic most dramatically affect essential workers and the predominant um, predominantly represented by members of our Latinx community. So there was a point in Marin County where 80% of all COVID-19 cases were occurring among residents of our Latinx community, community who are working since February under pandemic conditions before face coverings were required in um, especially like food services and construction and also because of institutional racism and income inequality we're forced to live in, are forced to live in crowded housing conditions, which then was a primary driver of, of COVID-19 transmission in our community, community and across the state. And that shifted after Halloween. The majority of cases now are among white residents um, who are, um, I classify them in two buckets. There is um, involuntary transmission. Again, people who due to low wages are living in crowded conditions and working in our skilled nursing facilities. And then there's vol voluntary drivers. And th that is what we're seeing now among the majority white residents in our community who are electing to engage in higher risk activities that are now affecting our community. And again, we, are, we have seen that shift. And I think there's tremendous silver linings that we really have strengthened our par partnership with the Latinx community and listening to their needs. And I think that's, uh, again, we have an opportunity now to learn what we, um, to implement what we've learned and to again, work together to prevent the outbreaks um, among the greater population of Marin County. Well, that Thank is such an Senator. important uh, message for people to hear because in, in talking with people, some communities feel as though they may have a, a you know, quote unquote demographic immunity that right. just does not exist, that they need to shake that, that sense of security off and, uh, and practice you know, everything they can, all the precaution they can um, to protect themselves and our community from spread. I look at the county data uh, regularly, particularly at the, uh, the skilled nursing facility data and to see that over 80% of the deaths in Marin are from uh, patients in the care of those facilities, but knowing that, uh, that that rate of death has slowed down tremendously and so that's been another area of focus for me in making sure that we have pandemic best practices in nursing facilities, as well as um, other congregate living communities um, where we really fail to um, provide the tools and resources necessary um, to protect uh, both the, the people in their care, but also the workers who the staff are often working at multiple facilities, uh, which further uh, speeds that spread and so that's um, going to continue to be um, a priority as, as we move through this legislative session as well. Um, and it's a personal priority for me. My father fell in uh, the first week of, of the stay at home order in March, and he lived in a skilled nursing facility for about five weeks where he was a patient there and he was uh, discharged. But uh, just in the months after more than a dozen patients there died of COVID-19 and uh, and I, I feel a great deal of responsibility to make sure that we're able to protect everyone uh, as much as we can. It's something that you're, you're bringing up the next point in the conversation as well, and you all have. And I'm going to start with superintendent, and then we're going to go to everybody. Part of the reality of the 2020, the year we're facing, and this equity equals access, is to confront realities and perceptions that we believe were true in February, we know are not true now. And part of that perception we, we want to unpack tonight is the perception that Marin has limited need. And I, I just want to hear from the superintendent, please, Bert, first. How has 2020 helped you and how does the community better understand the need that exists in Marin County? And it's going to lead to the community learning hubs and how that was developed. But if you could just talk a little bit about what you've learned, what you've unpacked, or what you'd like to share with the audience about the need that exists in this county specifically. 
Well, let me say first that I've learned that a lot of people in our community have had their heads in the sand. Uh, and so the sort of shocking, you know, oh my gosh, you're kidding. There's that many people in Marin County that are poor or living in difficult situations or working four or five jobs, kids who are home alone. And I think that this obviously um, helped amplify a reality that has existed, that we have known about, that we're working on, but that many in our community essentially turn their heads from, right? Because it happens to be in certain communities in Marin. And I think back to what you said, Mark, you know, I'm immune from that because I live X, right? So that's number one. Um, number two, while there, well, while there are many uh, people in our community who are doing well from a financial standpoint, um, one third of the children in Marin County are on free and reduced lunch, right? That's a lot of children, over 10,000 families, right? Who are making not enough money to feed a family of four by way of example. And so that, you know, target and focus um, helped us in the community say, wait a second, um, particularly um, as people were beginning to uh, develop learning pods for the privileged children. Um, and then what happens to the children that don't have the means? So we'll get, I know we'll get to the pod part, but bottom line is that, um, you know, that's a lot, of, a third of our kids are kids who um, have need. And it's the, I consider it the response of our responsibility of all of us um, in a community to ensure that we care for our children, not just those that are our own, but every single child deserves and must have um, access to all the things that we want for our own children. I think that lens becomes critical in the way we approach this. So let's let's go a little bit deeper in the learning hubs. Let's let's dive there and let's bring in everybody to the conversation because that's the need that showed up that we're highlighting tonight. So please dive a little bit deeper and explain how it was done with community as well and and just how do we get there and how's sure. it going? Yeah. So so picture um, that you know as as Dr. Santora said, uh, we know the schools are going to close. It is now uh, March 16th. I think that's a Monday, and we have. Um, nurse, essential workers, nurses, doctors, law enforcement, police, et cetera, and essential workers who need a place for their children. Mm -hmm. And so it became essential that we tried to figure out how we're going to serve these students. But what was happening was at the very moment people were shutting down, i.e. the schools are shutting, your schools are closed. And um, essentially, there were a few agencies that leaned in. And so the why, by way of example, right when you were closing programs, right, yourself, your, mm -hmm. your programs said, we're in, we're willing to be there, we're willing to staff, we're willing to do whatever we need to do. So it was absolutely remarkable to see the people who leaned in at the very beginning. And we're talking within days, hours of here we are with a crisis, what are we going to do? And the result was, um, that from the standpoint of the um, first pop-up childcare, it was uh, that Thursday where students were able to begin to attend school, come in and have a safe place to be there. So that was amazing. And then related to the actual learning hubs, that really keyed off of the equity conversations we were having with public health. And you could see in the paper what was happening uh, in communities. Parents were grouping up with their children, hiring a teacher, to come take care of their children. And we said, whoa, 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 what are we gonna do here? And essentially there was the why again, along with other partners, we have over 50 learning hubs operating awesome. um, right now throughout the county. Um, and they are, the priority is going to children who are on free and reduced lunch throughout Marin County. So this is essentially you know, targeted for those you know, those particular students. And what's happening is nothing short of um, amazing, actually. Uh, we still, there's so many more students, you know, we're really only getting, frankly, to about 25% of that population. Um, and that's with a lot of different partners, but we have a, you know, a lot further to go. Um, and I just want to call out one of the first people to sort of um, put in some resource was Bank of Marin. Um, and they said, here's 20,000, um, excuse me, $200,000 to support that. Um, and our Marine Community Foundation as well has just designated another 500,000 to support awesome. specifically 
these learning hubs so that these children um, are able to add back to access their educational opportunity in a safe place where they're connected, where they have appropriate um, internet connection, access to the right computers and appropriate supervision. But I will say this, I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of the Y, had been on the local board in Marin for some time. And I, I always knew we were great, but I'm talking, you all, have been nothing truly short of amazing in what you've done in this particular space at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Santori, I want to bring in the, the physical, mental health and the families. How are they engaged in these learning hubs and how are you looking at the health, the holistic health of the youth that are being served? And I think this is the most critical piece. As a physician, my first duty is to do no harm. Mm. And what we have seen is these learning hubs are an effective strategy without schools being fully reopened to engage students and families in a safe, secure place where they can have nutrition, um, social and emotional support, academic support. Um, I'm privileged and being a working mom, it is so challenging right now um, to have kids in a part-time environment. And what the Learning Hub showed from the get-go, they were heroes to us because they showed how we can safely get this done. We only had one during that entire time before schools reopened in September 8th, we only had one school-based transmission. It was in a one preschool student to another preschool student and they weren't wearing face covers yet and their mm -hmm. preschool kids, so keeping them together um, is keeping them apart. It's really hard to do. It's hard to keep any child apart, <laughs> but um, it showed that we can create safe spaces um, and try and prevent uh, this growing educational attainment gap um, from growing faster and larger than we can manage. And we know it's there. Um, there's great inequities now and it's gonna be growing um, until we can get kids back into school five days a week um, for full-time instruction. We demonstrated we can do it safely. We have partners, um, we have school districts doing it safely. And that's how we're gonna start uh, addressing this. Um, until then, that, that day happens, which will be a, a dream for Mary Jane and I. Um, learning hubs are just such a critical role for protecting students. And um, there are significant harms that are happening now. Our children and family services are busier than they've ever seen as kids come back into school. Um, abuse that has been undetected is now being detected. Um, and that's why our schools are just part and learning hubs and schools are part of our the fabric of our community. We depend on them. We need them um, from nutrition to childcare to um, being a, a an adult, who, another adult that a child has support from. Um, this is, schools are more than just books um, or, or is now Zoom classrooms. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're a part of the holistic development. And I really believe firmly we are developing the next greatest generation. These kids are gonna have grit, they're resilient, mm -hmm. and we need to make sure all kids um, they, they learn how to be gritty now. We need to get them back into that classroom environment so their brains can start flourishing and thriving um, by getting what teachers do best and it's in that in-person instruction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Assembly Member Levine, one of your priorities is education initiatives. So these hubs and the COVID education slide, which is going to continue to be a, an issue for years to come potentially, how is this changing your legislative priorities at the state level and how you represent us? I think we need to work on making sure that we've got uh, as many children into hubs as possible that, that we find a way to reach them and communicate to them about this opportunity for them to, to plug into that. Without the hubs, I think that uh, this, the original stay at home period in the summer would have been impossible because mm. uh, essential workers would have been unable to care for their children. And, um, and so that, that it, without that, uh, a, a lot of what we've been able to do and how we've gotten through this would have been impossible. But we need, to, we need to recognize that that itself isn't just going to school and we need to do more. And so that's why the state is investing in ways to mitigate that education loss. I'm not sure it's enough money that we've budgeted so far, about $5 billion. Um, and if we um, are going to be flexible enough to recognize the uh, kind of the hole we need to dig our, our way out of to make sure that students are getting the education they need so that they can live the, the, the lives that they 
deserve be engaged in society at the level that we need them to be uh, and to work at the capacity that we hope that they can uh, to provide for themselves, provide to their families. And, and, uh, and so we have that work cut out for us. If that means um, that we use other months of the year to give students who wish to uh, more education, more days in a classroom, these are some of the ideas that I'm open, uh, open-minded to. I've got colleagues that are trying to push legislation to get their communities in the state just to where Marin already is. So Marin's far, far ahead of, of other places, even here in the Bay Area, where students have not set foot into a classroom. Um, and so we'll be seeing legislation to mandate that uh, post this surge, uh, at, at once we get into a certain level, those schools will, by, by necessity, must uh, reopen for students. Uh, but hopefully here in Marin, we're going to be safely, as has been described, be able to have our students in those classrooms learning. Um, but I've got to hear from you, uh, the community, the people who are participating in this, definitely from Mary Jane, uh, how we can make sure that students don't get left behind and uh, miss out uh, from this past year. Well, you actually- uh, I, I know I will hear from Mary Jane. That's, that's a guarantee. So, Superintendent, you're gonna say something too? No, I was just going to say, no, no, the amount you've dedicated is not enough, just to confirm <laughs> that for sure, at yeah. number one. Um, but definitely, I think that, that some children have always needed more to have access to opportunities, right? Some kids need more to get the same. And I feel like um, we need to make sure that as many different options, and as you say, what are the choices that can be available to a family to ensure that their children actually have opportunities. The kinds of issues that we're seeing, many of them are falling on the mental health side, right? Students that are, their, their affect is flat. They're not interacting as often or as frequently with even at the home front, parents who are very, very worried, still lack of supervision. And, you know, sometimes we focus on the poor children, right? Children on the free and reduced lunch and picture that middle band of family right? Where the parents have to go to work, they don't really have additional resources. So I feel like this is an all kid focus, right? As you're thinking about sort of what the future looks like. But I do think it's important that, um, that the incentives that you provide us as schools um, don't actually get in the way of getting schools reopened. So I think that's really important because the issue is that you know, we, you, you know, there was clarity early on that focus was in person. And as you know, there was a lot of pushback on that and you know, people kind of backed away. But I think that will be part of the story is trying to make sure that there isn't by, by um, you know, incentivizing not being back in school. Because if, I, if you're gonna give me the money and you're gonna let me right, do everything and not have to reopen school, you, and you need to, I think, rethink that just as a structure. I want the money. Um, but I want to be held accountable for those opportunities that we need to make sure that we provide. And, and of course, it has to be safe. This cannot be a situation, right, where people don't feel cared for in a compassionate way and that they're absolutely safe to return. And there's places um, throughout our state that actually are not uh, attending to that part, right? People that are saying, oh, we're not going to follow the rules, no masks. And I think, you know, they'll, they'll definitely, I think, have to be um, some accountability measures that you'll have to put in and some people won't like it, but that it will be critical, I think, to our, to our next step statewide. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about culture because as I've spoken with my colleagues about the playground issue, how parents and children navigate crowded playgrounds in one community or another is different. And, uh, and in Marin, um, we think that we prioritize health uh, pretty well and, uh, and that can be seen and filtered down at the playgrounds or in the classrooms because children really take that, uh, that on from their parents and the, the adults in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think just one thing to add to that, if you just take just the basic of wearing a mask, right? Wearing a face covering. Public health in Marin was very clear from the very beginning. You know, when people said, oh, they're too little, they're not gonna wear the mask. Well, wait a second, education, that's your job to teach them prioritize. In other words, this is a priority. We, there's many things we teach, right? And we need to make sure because this mask wearing is life and death. And so you most everywhere in Marin County, you see the little children 
wearing their masks, wearing them right. And if you ask them, they know why they're wearing it, which is probably the most important. They know uh, they're so, keeping themselves safe. It's so true. I marvel how even today my sixth grader came home and she still had her mask on when she <laughs> arrived uh, at the front door. Yeah, great. What a fantastic conversation. We um, asked our panelists, uh, we told our panelists that these, these town halls work best when there's a dialogue and a conversation between them. So we definitely got what we were hoping for there. Thank you so much. If it's um, at the right time, I'm gonna turn to a couple of questions from the audience and direct them to the, to the panelists. Uh, uh, I'll send this to Dr. Santora. Um, from the audience, I still see many youth athletic activities where many kids are not wearing masks. Marin Health did report that there was an uptick in transmission connected to youth athletics and that there was a meeting for coaches across the county to learn how to deal with this. Question is, should I expect to be seeing student athletes wearing masks? If I do see what I perceive as a violation of this directive, should I report it somewhere? Yes, you should be uh, seeing everyone wearing masks now outdoors. There was a time we were allowing youth sports activities if they were maintaining more than six feet distance outdoors not to um, require a mask for that activity. That's changed now. Um, they do need to wear masks if outdoors, except if swimming in an outdoor pool. You're not expected to wear a mask in a pool. We are expecting people to report violations. Um, Youth athletics in Moran are very important. Um, YMCA is very important part of the athletics, but we've seen that has been a slippery slope um, for families where they have been traveling out of county, engaging in competition and trying to find that gray space. And that's why we reconvened um, the organizers of youth sports to see that they play such a critical role in keeping schools open. That's our primary goal is to get these schools open, keep them open. And when people have um, start slipping and um, carpooling and going into competitions out of county, out of state, then there's a risk of COVID entering back into the school community and it increases fear, worry, anxiety among school staff. And we need them to remain confident and feel confident in creating that safe environment. So we are calling on the community to work together with us. We're calling on youth sports to work together with us. We have a light at the end of our tunnel. It's this vaccine. It's gonna arrive in Marin County on the 15th and our work is gonna begin on that front. And if we can hunker down together um, through these early, early parts of winter um, and, and kind of refrain from the activities that we just jumped at once we reopened, I think that's gonna buy us the time to get the vaccine distributed. And then we'll, we'll be prioritizing, I just spoke with Dr. Willis, you may have seen it. Um, um, we are gonna be prior, prioritizing vaccine distribution to school staff and teachers. Um, as essential workers, they'll be our first um, group in the, once it's allowed, uh, once we get to that right phase, um, teachers will be teachers and school staff will be first. And again, we, we there's light. We just have to hunker down for this next couple of weeks to get through this surge. And it's happening. And I know people don't see it, but we just got a, a request from Imperial County to accept over 60 patients. They're trying to move out of their county and we do help. But right now we're about to fill up our own um, hospitals and ICU. So this it's happening. You need to stay at home and we'll get there. Thank you for the great thorough answer to that question. One of the things I learned tonight, and I think a theme is, is actually about how safe the schools are for our children and, and in comparatively to other places in our community. Um, a great takeaway. Uh, uh, Superintendent Burke, I, I did get a, a precise question from the audience, um, uh, not questioning, but wanting to understand, uh, could you explain more about how one large cohort at school is safer than two? That got a little attention. Sure, sure. Well, actually, Dr. Santora should um, answer that, but why don't you answer it, Lisa, because I'm getting that from your direction. Go ahead. Well, the more stable of an environment we can create, um, the better for our community as a whole. So getting um, kids back in a full-time schedule at school in their regular classrooms um, where we are not seeing, we don't see student-to-student -student transmission or student-to-teacher transmission, and so that stabilizes the cohort. Anytime we start creating mixing and matching, then we have to find alternative arrangements and mixing of households in order to provide the childcare and socialization supports. So we have, um, and, and everything always starts larger with the novel virus. So you've seen, we've now reduced from 14 days um, down to 10 days for quarantine because we take a very conservative approach when something is new. Um, the CDC started with 
six feet. We're having all the, the vision is having deaths six feet apart. And that's again, starting when we had knew very little about this virus. Now, as we learned around this virus, we've seen that um, the, the absolute risk of kids um, of being in a room and don't forget about if they're just having face coverings or other, um, or other protective measures like washing hands, these, these all work. Um, if students are one meter apart, so a desk of more than four feet apart, if 10% of those kids are in that classroom are infected, and we have many measures to prevent that from happening, if 10% of those kids are infected, there's only a 1% risk of an infection in that classroom. And again, that's not with all the other measures we have in place to prevent 10% of a student classroom from having infection. I think people are just scared. They think they're walking into a room and it's filled with COVID and they're going to get sick. And that's not how this virus works. It's that you um, you're, we have so many protective measures. We're staying at home if we're feeling sick, we're getting tested. The state's done an amazing job. Um, Assembly member Levine's office worked with us to even get swabs in March. So we have great elected officials that are trying to get access to testing. So we know the status of people. Um, we have a decision tree on who should get kept at home. So we're creating the safest possible environment. And if it's a stable cohort, that is the best cohort. And so that's what's gonna allow the, max, the optimal return of all students back to school is having a stable, regular sized classroom, which we believe we can do safely. If we learn differently, we'll adjust. Dr. Willis and I are always ready to adapt our guidance based on emerging science and evidence. But at this time, we are seeing in classrooms across the county that a full classroom size can be done, but can be executed safely. And we do have schools that are executing on that right now um, and feel good about it, feel like it's going well. And just to say it in a slightly different way, Imagine if you have one cohort of students, right? There it is, those 14 students, and then a different 14, you're essentially dealing with what are they doing on those other days? They're in other childcare, they're in other, right? Compared to one stable cohort. And so um, it's not, I think, and, and we're also finding that uh, for some of our teachers to be an AM and a PM, two totally different cohorts, all the dis deep cleaning that happens in between, and they might have, let's just say, 10 and 10, that some are actually looking at it and saying, well, wait a second, I'd rather have four hours a day with the full cohort. So it is, uh, it's progressing. Uh, oh, oh, we, we're getting some real time questions um, from the audience, which is just fantastic. So Superintendent Burke, could, could you expand on how that will work um, uh, with multiple class uh, classes? Like for example, at high school, when they come back in the, um, in the hopefully in January. Right, right. So the 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 way that the high schools are being looked at is slightly different. Dr. Santoro would be able to answer that as well. But just imagine um, that it's not they're not looking at one class as a cohort, but rather up to three classes as a cohort. Um, and the key, of course, the re what's the reason for cohort? Um, so that in the event of a COVID positive situation or an exposure you know who it is that you need to have a have quarantine right so you don't have to quarantine the whole school and that's what becomes i think the critical nature i mean this is you know the the goal or the approach is that everything we do is based on every single person you come in contact with you assume they're covid positive so that sounds a little bit that's important because then you know what to do you're distancing you're wearing the mask you're doing all those things but the key is if you cannot have the names of who's in the cohort, whether it's a single cohort or a larger three classes in a, in a high school, then you would have to shut down the whole school in the event of a positive, right? So Lisa, what would you add to that? Just it's the same thing as I said before that we had a very conservative approach. So when we close an elementary school cohort for one positive case, the majority of students never had a close contact. We haven't even we've done it. We've had we've closed um, cohorts, but the majority of students haven't um, had close contact. When we've um, tested those students after cohort closure, there's not positives. And again, that's because we're creating non-close contact environments to start with. What we're learning now, um, but we're still taking that very conservative approach in the elementary school level to close the full cohort. Now we're learning with our middle school um, and high schools is that they they move differently and, and it's more like an adult, adult an adult pattern again, where there's they we're reevaluating even the cohort closure at that school level because the reality is it's most 
middle school and high school students would be able to identify their close contacts. So we are looking at technology like the app that's gonna be released from the state to be a tool and to consider how we um, address positives in the secondary school environment because it's the harm of a total school closure outweigh, will outweigh the benefits, especially because most people, if they're following the rules, are not gonna have define close contact in the school environment. It's more likely to be with their friends when they leave the school campus and that's when they're gonna have that contact. So we're looking at alternative ways, for example, engaging um, athletic trainers and other school staff in contact tracing at the secondary school level. So we don't have to be, um, so we can take more of a scalpel approach um, rather than a hammer approach with closures. That being said, the state has provided strong guidance around when do we have to close a school. One case doesn't mean close a school, but it's 5% of the school community testing positive. And again, I think this is where there's um, dissonance um, where the community wants a zero risk environment. There's no zero risk environment. And again, the benefits of, of education um, and trying to minimize closures as much as safely possible um, out, will outweigh the harms. And again, we are gonna be data-driven and science-based as we begin relaxing some of our, our approaches. Um, and especially with the emergence of the vaccine that will accelerate our ability to do that. We do believe the vaccine is going to come to the general public probably sooner than um, expected. So I think that's another light again for us. But but just at the high school level, just to note, for a student to even get into school one day for a couple of hours is huge compared to not having those connections. And so whatever the size is, whatever the school decide, decides to do, it will be so important that those first steps are taken. Um, because there's too many students that um, we're losing, to be perfectly honest. And just one day back, right, with the t to get to be with the teacher, even if it's who knows what the structures will be, but I think it will be important to begin to see that. And our districts are taking very seriously how it is they're going to structure it so that the staff feel safe and the students uh, feel safe as well. Thank you, everybody. Um... That's a great time together. And I wanna to wrap it up, but I wanna give you one more moment to just talk about a few things. One, if you could just give your elevator speech, what should the audience hear from you as we wrap up the evening and how to continue asking questions. We're getting more that we can't get to right now that are very important. So if we can just talk about what's, your, what's the last thing that we need to hear from the audience that can support you in these efforts and how can we continue asking questions? So let's start with assembly member Levine, please. Thank you, Jamie. The first thing I just want to express is my gratitude. Uh, gratitude to the Y for everything you've done for children throughout the Bay Area and here in Marin uh, that have just served them so well during this moment. And also how flexible you were to help serve the entire family through this and, and the services that you really opened up to, to make it a little bit easier for people to get through these past 10 months. Um, I want to also say thank you to, to Mary Jane and, and your entire staff uh, to, to get the schools where they are. Um, that is changing lives every day. And we are so fortunate for, for you uh, being in your role at this time uh, and, and the experience that you bring to this to help steer uh, the, the ship. Uh, and the school leaders throughout all of our districts have done an amazing job of it. Dr. Santora, I mean, we've got... Dr. Fauci in Washington, and we've got you and Dr. Willis in Marin, and I have learned so much uh, by working with your office, by working with you and, and Matt, and uh, has it, 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 the, the way that you have uh, worked with uh, the county and all of us um, educated me so I can be a better advocate on behalf of all of our constituents, the people that we serve. Um, it's just, we are so fortunate We've really got some stars here, uh, so thank you. Um, it was mentioned by John early on um, that it's the, the third day of the new session and uh, we are in the period now up until February where we're working on legislation that, uh, that we'll be introducing. And, uh, and so I, I do wanna invite people if they've got concerns or thoughts or ideas, um, things that we should change that might require a change in law to send those ideas to me. I've got a, a website where you can find a way to, to plug that in. Uh, and also um, my email address, which is assemblymember 
assembly.levine at assembly.ca.gov, assemblymember.levine at assembly.ca.gov, and also my office. So my, my office has been working virtually since March. You can call us anytime. So we still answer the phone. We're just not getting the phone in the office. And that number in Marin is 415 479 49 I know that so many people in the community have struggled economically and that the Employment Devel Development Department has not met uh, the challenge that we've been through. And, uh, and so I am grateful for, for my staff uh, fielding a lot of calls about that, but I'm grateful to those of you who have called asking for help. Um, we, we talk and I started talking about legislation but we can help you and make your life easier with a phone call on an issue that you're struggling with. And often, and th this past year has been about unemployment. And so we need to hear from you if things aren't working, we wanna help you um, get the, the benefits that you have earned and, uh, and make sure that you will not fall through the cracks. Um, and, and, and so don't be um, shy to call us. I, I would say that too often people call us uh, as a, a last resort um, when they have reached uh, maximum frustration. And I am glad for people to start calling me at the, the front end uh, and, and to be in uh, that process because we can help you. Um, or if we can't help you, we'll, we'll try our very best, but we will do our best to, to help you. Um, and so uh, I, I had mentioned some of the great work that the Y has done. I also wanna say that I know how hard this has been on your staff as well. And I just wanna recognize them they, they've done a lot for our kids and, uh, and I know that they've been struggling and the why has been going through a lot of, a lot of ways to be flexible um, for all of this. And I just wanna express gratitude for that. I think that's something I recognized over Thanksgiving was how much gratitude I actually had, even though it was the most lonely Thanksgiving I'd had in my lifetime, but it wasn't that lonely. I had my wife and my two kids, but, um, but I, was, I was filled with an abundance of gratitude nonetheless. The other thing is, Listen to Dr. Santora. I'm, I think that she's going to say some really important things that we need to hear. And uh, we need to get through the next months with uh, as, many as, as many ICU beds as possible to care for people, not just with COVID-19, but for everyday trauma that our ICU beds are for, whether that's a stroke or a heart attack or another household emergency that people have. Uh, and so I wanna say again, thank you to the Y. Thank you for hosting this. And again, abundance of gratitude to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. I'm going to give it to Superintendent. Same question. Uh, last thoughts and resources. And Dr. Centaur, you're going last. Uh -huh. you don't mind. Okay. So um, wear your masks, please. Wash your hands. Um, follow the follow the public health orders. And you do know that here in Marin County, you have the most amazing teachers, paraprofessionals, school secretaries, superintendents principals. These people are working night and day on behalf of the children of others. They want nothing more to get your children back into school. And, you know, someone said, oh, well, Mary Jane, it's not me. It is the, the rank and file people at your schools that are working so hard and we owe them. Um, we owe them uh, the health of our children in so many ways. So instead of sending vitriolic emails, which I get about 20 a day, by the way, um, mm. is send that email, not to me, but to them and say, hey, by the way, thanks. I noticed mm. my kids back in school and throughout this state, that's not happening. So we appreciate it. So that's what I would like to say. Any, any way to reach out besides that email? Oh, not the, Yes, yes, no. yes. Rapid response at winschools.org. Thank you. We, okay. we have an email, anything that goes in there, uh, we respond as rapidly as we can. Any questions at all? Thank you so much. And it's a health pandemic, so we have to end it with Dr. Santora, our public health expert. So please wrap this up. Thank you. Um, I just encourage everyone to stay at home for these next four weeks so our kids can stay in school. Our top priority has been our children and having an equity focused approach to our work which means we want all students in Marin to get back into school. And so it really depends on us 
continuing our work together, um, hunkering down um, and staying inside, suspending those play dates and those planned gatherings that you had. We saw what happened. We went from uh, 200 active cases to 467 active cases in one week. And we know what we can do together to stop this and stopping to have those pri private gatherings following our guidance. And that's gonna get us through to January 4th, where we hope to return back to a, a red tier so we can support local businesses um, returning. Um, and just again, I, I just wanna end on my deepest gratitude to this entire community. The majority of Marin County residents are following our guidance. We are seeing successes every day in schools where um, we heard a story today where parents followed the guidance. We didn't have to shut um, cohorts down because they stayed at home after engaging a risk activity. They stayed home when kids were symptomatic and um, we can do this together. We got this. Um, we just need to hunker down for a couple more weeks and the vaccine is coming. That's the theme of our office. And just again, great thanks to our elected officials and to our partners like at the Y, um, we wouldn't be doing this. Um, public health couldn't do it alone. We need to um, stick together. And my deepest gratitude to my mentor, Mary Jane Burke. Um, we are a tag team and, um, and mama bears um, getting our schools back open. And um, I'm just so thankful. So thank you. And any re resource or email you'd like to provide for the group for questions? Well, of course, COVID-19 schools at marinecounty.org, or you can call our call center 415-473-7191. That's COVID-19 schools at marinecounty.org, or call 415-473-7191. Thank you so much. And thank you. I want to thank everybody on the panelists for participating tonight. Much appreciated. And I want to thank the audience. Uh, you're on Zooms all the time. So being here, listening, and participating, we want to thank you as well. We hope we're informative. We've gave you some new information and we continue to support the work that's going on by our panel panelists every single day because we need you here. And I got to wrap up by thanking John Everly for thank moderating you. with me yes. and being here as well. So thank you for being a great moderator with me and engaging and bringing the conversation to life. So thank you all. Have a great night and we wrap up our third uh, in a series. There'll be more to come. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.